Uh, our next speaker is Matt Garcia, who also has been using CHTC for some time. I think he spoke at Condor Week in 2018 and will be providing an update on a project that's quite different and new since then. So I'll hand it over to Matt. Thanks. Can everybody hear me? Okay. Good on Zoom. Okay. So uh, last time I presented here at HD Condor Week was in 2018. Uh, that was some um, research from my dissertation where I'd used CHTC resources and OSG uh, resources to do tons of satellite image analysis uh, to look at forests around the upper Great Lakes. Uh, my research uh, is in the Department of Forest and Wildlife Ecology. My advisor for my dissertation is Phil Townsend, and I've been working with uh, Brian Sturdivant from the U.S. Forest Service for quite a long time now. Um, I came into the CHTC community from a uh, software carpentry course uh, that Christina and Lauren had taught. I had just started learning Python before that, and that, <clears throat> excuse me, got me a lot deeper into using Python and then applying it to CHTC resources for my research. Uh, at about the same time in 2018 that I presented uh, some of my dissertation work here, I had already started my postdoc work in which I uh, started working with uh, colleagues in the Canadian Forest Service, as well as continuing my work with Brian uh, in the US Forest Service. Uh, and what we're doing is we're looking at an outbreak of a conifer eating moth in Eastern Canada. Uh, so in Canada, timber is a huge industry uh, and anything that threatens the, that timber uh, is of course a major uh, concern to the to the uh, Canadian government. And so with an ongoing outbreak in Eastern Canada, uh, we wanted to uh, give a closer look at some of the um, biological processes going on. One of the ones that uh, is least understood is dispersal of adult spruce budworm moths uh, in the summertime. And I have a great background in weather modeling and understanding how to run those. And so I was able to bring that expertise into the project uh, and expand from there. So uh, what we're looking at here, you can see there kind of the annual life cycle of the spruce budworm. Uh, and then here laid out uh, over time through the year, the spruce budworm looks like this little caterpillar that uh, emerges from uh, Overwintering, uh, just as the conifers start to bud out, their favorite trees are uh, balsam fir and spruce. Uh, and so they chew on the needles of those balsam fir and spruce. Uh, if they do that five or six years in a row, it eventually kills the tree entirely. Uh, and so that's what you're seeing there in the middle photograph. The brown trees are pretty much dead. The green trees are very lucky. Uh, and um, eventually they get into uh, late spring and summer, they turn to moths. That's when they mate and the females drop their eggs where they grew up, drop half of their eggs where they grew up and then carry the other half of their eggs to who knows where. And the idea of this project was to kind of figure out possibly where they went. Uh, so there, Dispersal uh, as adults is uh, driven almost entirely by the weather. Uh, their entirely entire biological process is driven by temperature uh, and their flight capability is driven by temperature in coordination with wind direction, uh, wind speed, uh, other factors like that. So, uh, you see that full biological process that covers approximately a year for each generation of the budworm. I'm focused just on that part so far. And I'll show later that we're looking to expand into the rest of the year as well. So uh, we built a model. Uh, it's an individual base model um, built in Python. It is heavily dependent on weather uh, model outputs. 
Um, we put together a kind of modeling framework that looks like that on the right. Uh, this is not what I would run through CHTC, of course. This is just the overall study framework. Uh, we published the first part of that, the, this whole uh, modeling description uh, in January. I'm currently working, uh, you can see there that's part one, just the description of the model. I'm working on, right now on parameter calibration and feedback uh, to uh, modeling results and comparison with radar observations. So I'm working on that paper right now. Um, I'm also today going to present to you uh, two pieces of what I've been working on. So this first part that has to do with the weather modeling covers high throughput computing and high performance computing. The weather model is MPI based. Uh, so that runs on the HPC system here. And I'm starting to run on uh, other resources as well. Um, and then the other workflow is a uh, Markov chain Monte Carlo type process that I'm running literally right now uh, at, here at uh, CHTC. I've got about a third of a full summer simulated and I'm looking to finish that off and see how it goes with a sequential daily simulation process. So you can see here, uh, these are some example results uh, at high resolution, three kilometer resolution at about hourly time steps. Uh, from the WERF model, uh, you can see some of the details here. If you want more information, there's a lot more in that first paper that we published. Uh, but primarily, uh, WERF needs to be run on a high performance computing cluster. Um, so I run it uh, with at least 60 cores here at uh, UW. When I run on the Stampede 2 cluster at TAC uh, through the uh, NSF exceed allocation that I have, uh, I use at least 80 cores there. I can get a day's uh, simulation done in about four hours uh, down to the resolution that we're uh, interested in right now. We need that kind of resolution because there's a lot of terrain in this region. Um, this region here, you can see there is uh, Northern Maine, uh, New Brunswick, and then Quebec in Canada, in Eastern Canada, um, all around the St. Lawrence uh, Seaway there, or the St. Lawrence Estuary. And so there's a lot of terrain around there and those that terrain affects wind directions, temperatures, uh, and we need uh, some pretty good spatial detail in order to get the right winds and temperatures to drive uh, this moth activity when they do disperse from where they grew up. And then there's, uh, there's two uh, separate processes here in the post-processing, um, looking at large scale weather uh, to see how that supports particular dates of dispersal uh, and then high resolution that goes into the actual flight simulations. So this would be the, uh, uh, workflow uh, that actually I implement here at CHTC and then th through CHTC uh, submission protocols using the high performance computing system. So I'll show some of that as well. I love Dagman. So I use Dagman for all of this organization uh, and uh, it keeps it nice and simple. And the uh, developers in HD Condor have been immensely helpful uh, in uh, making sure that I can fit the high performance computing component into the middle of this larger Dagman type of uh, processing. So uh, like I said, pre-processing, uh, I can run that on HTC uh, resources, uh, single processor, uh, but high memory load. Uh, and that takes up the top part of this here. Uh, the WERF model itself needs to run on high performance computing system. So it feeds uh, output from the pre-processing to uh, input to the WERF model. And then the WERF model output comes back to uh, 
H, uh, the high throughput computing uh, for two different uh, avenues of post-processing uh, and usage. So this part here on the bottom right, the, the Pi ATM flight modeling, uh, that'll be the second workflow that I show you in just a few minutes. Uh, this will be the first part of the DAG. You can see there, there's uh, several uh, components in the pre-processing uh, and that feeds into a splice DAG that uh, handles the WERF modeling and then the post-processing that comes out of the WERF modeling. You can see here uh, a lot of the uh, input data to the pre-processing comes from external sources. So that gets downloaded on the fly when it's needed. Um, this would be a DAG to run the entire month of July, 2013. Uh, and so in order to run July 31st, that bleeds over into August 1st. And so I need to do the pre-processing on August as well. Um, and then that feeds into a DAG that would basically run the entire month of July uh, through WERF and then through the post-processing procedures uh, that vary with the season. So you can see there uh, high performance computing is used for the WERF uh, portion of it. It gets all the variables that it needs. The configuration and the executable files are generated on the fly uh, according to the date and the number of processors. So I can play around with how many processors are used and see what the optimum is there. Uh, and then each part of the output uh, gets post-processed separately uh, especially in the warm season, when the moths are flying, I want to process uh, that slightly coarser output. So I can do that completely separately from the fine scale processing uh, that is used for uh, simulating the biological processes uh, for the moths. Um, and then from there, this would be an example of the submission file for the using the high performance computing component. That's in the grid universe. Uh, I don't believe that was mentioned earlier this week, but this is part of what uh, the HD Condor team has been, one of the things that they've been working on. Uh, you can see there, our local uh, HPC system runs on Slurm. And so we need to uh, specify all the Slurm variables uh, right up right up front here. Um, there are a couple of special pieces here on request CPUs and request memory that we found out experimentally need to be explicitly undefined. Um, uh, but this, this is an example of uh, basically what Jamie Fry helped me work out uh, and we found works very well. Um, Otherwise, it looks like a basic HD Condor submission script uh, with a lot of the other fields that are uh, listed there. And then, um, but now that I have an allocation on Stampede 2, which has a 2FA requirement to submit, to get onto and submit jobs to, uh, we're uh, going to start to work on transforming this script to external submissions. From there, uh, the actual uh, nightly um, moth dispersal uh, runs using a whole bunch of different uh, data set inputs. Uh, and I will actually move through these. Um, there's the uh, part of the biological process where females lay the eggs on the host trees. Um, and so they have daily changes in their, their weight as they lay eggs, and then their flight capability changes with their weight, um, and then everything changes with temperature. Uh, males and females, we found, have different flight capabilities, uh, very different flight altitudes and distances. Um, those can vary day to day with the weather conditions, of course, um, but this is one of the premier examples of our uh, simulation output. Um, this is all run uh, basically on 
in a DAG with single nodes in the DAG for each night. And the pre-processing provides the pool of moths that get simulated. And then each simulation basically just selects a thousand moths out of that pool at random and runs them through the simulation uh, that we built. Uh, and then the males and females have different spatial outcomes and different roles. You can see there the males would have landed in all of the gray area. Females landed in the colored area, depending uh, on how many eggs they're bringing into that location. And that is what we would use to evaluate what the potential activity for the spruce budworm is the next year when they come out in the spring and start chewing on more trees. So uh, in general, uh, the, thank you. Uh, the, uh, we're running ensembles of simulations so that we get a good sample of the moth population that's available on each given night. Um, this runs then sequentially over the nights in the season when the moths are emerging. Uh, so it becomes a Markov chain uh, process with Monte Carlo selection of the moths that get run in each simulation. And then I bring all that information back together uh, after each night simulation to do some tabulation and some calculations of survival likelihood. Some moths land in the water, some moths don't fly at all, other moths land in non-forest locations and they live to fly another night. Uh, and then some moths land in the forest and lay more eggs and then go on to the next night until they have exhausted their adulthood, essentially. So it's a repeated process. Uh, each node in the DAG uh, is very similar to the node before uh, with the pre-processing you can see there. And so it's basically this branching process of possibilities, um, multiple timelines. That's the, if anyone's on Twitter, that's the reference to Loki that I promised. So the timeline continually branches from day to day. Each day produces any number of new possibilities and each of those possibilities for each moth needs to be taken into account when we tabulate all of the probabilities of where eggs end up by the end of the summer and then get carried over into the next season. So you can see there an example calculation of what the probabilities are as it goes along from day zero to day four, say, um, of any given specific moth and where it could end up. Um, so I love this because I can easily take that pre-processing uh, part of the, the DAG out and make it its own DAG node so that we can build in more biological processes uh, for that daytime part of the model, aging, mating, subcanopy -can dispersal, uh, over position depends on temperature, all sorts of things like that. And then of course we can expand the entire scope of the DAG uh, to more easily cover, easily-ish, uh, cover the full year's uh, biological cycle, uh, which is a lot more biological model that I'll be tackling over the next year or so. So um, things are going great. No pain points. Everything's looking good. We're working on getting high performance computing at Stampede into this process. Thanks very much. <laughs>